All right, that seems to be actually working. Um, I don't need that message. Hi everyone, how's it going? Tim here, and this is BXGS Weekly, episode 9, I think. Man, that was... <laughs> Every time I say the same shit, it's been so many episodes, and um, it kind of really was. Um, this time around, we don't really have that many news, but we do have quite a lot of really cool new libraries and demos. So we are just gonna go through whatever we have and have a look at that stuff. As usual, you can find the whole uh, links and whatever I'm talking about on GitHub under building X with JS slash BXJS weekly. This is in episode nine uh, markdown. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, link should be in the description below. Um, so yeah, go ahead and uh, knock yourself out if you don't wanna listen to me talk basically. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Um, so the first thing we have is an article by Kansi Dots called Pure Modules. And it talks about the, uh, essentially it's discussion around the ES modules and how they impact the performance and maintainability. Let me enable the JavaScript real quick to make the tweets render properly. So uh, it all started with a tweet by Ingvar Stepanian. Uh, let me disable, uh, God damn it! I, I right, I rebooted the computer and now everything is enabled back. Okay, sorry, apologies for that. Let us continue with this. So uh, it all started by the tweet from uh, Ingvar Stepanian, who is, I believe it's now working on a Chrome team. And uh, he's, yeah, he's, the gist is that ES6 modules has a missed opportunity of making modules completely pure, meaning that you cannot have any code execution in there, which would result in a very straightforward dependency graph. And you would exactly know what will happen without having to wait for the execution on and requires, right? So this article goes in details and to explain what is the pure modules? Uh, how would they work? What are the consequences of having the modules as they are right now? And it's a really interesting insight into how the modules work and how they might work and how can you specifically write pure modules in the current way, right? So the easiest way is, for example, the to export the init function that you have to call explicitly and that's what I uh, typically do when I develop my stuff. So I think it's a really good pattern. And uh, if you are not familiar with it, do have a look at that. Uh, it's a very good introduction to uh, pure modules and pure um, sort of, I guess, functional way for approaching to modules, uh, I guess like this. Um, but yeah. All right, let us continue. We got the next article, which is called Massive Update to Retyped. Um, now, this is an interesting thing. So I, I thought maybe I should put this into releases or maybe into demos. But you know, it's a pretty large article describing the changes to retyped. And the interesting thing, I never saw this project prior to this article. So I thought, okay, you know, let's just put it here and let's gonna be an article. So if you are just like me and not familiar with a retype project, then uh, you are gonna be um, at least intrigued. So basically the idea is that retype provides a bridge to building Electron, Node, whatever JavaScript apps using C Sharp. So if C Sharp is your gem and you're looking for a way to create JavaScript apps, then have a look at that. It seems to be very well developed, very well maintained and has a Visual Studio integration and even project templates and everything seems to be very easy to set up. And it quite literally allows you to write JavaScript apps in C Sharp. Because, you know, I mean, like at this point, I think there's um, not that many features C Sharp has that I like above the JavaScript. So the optional chaining and, and piping and all that stuff is still, you know, in pipeline for JavaScript. But for example, C Sharp has optional chaining, which is amazing. Um, I don't know if actually C Sharp has pipes. It's probably closer to the F Sharp stuff, but whatever. So if C Sharp is your jam and you want to check it out, you want to still build uh, React apps, I imagine there's a simple way to do that. Uh, check out Retyped. It seems like they've added a lot of bindings for a lot of new libraries and uh, seems like you can use just about anything you want, which is kind of great. It also seems like it also relies on a TypeScript, which is also great. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's actually a Microsoft project. That's a good question. Is that a Microsoft maintained project or is that like a third party thing? Um, but anyway, if C Sharp is your gem, then do have a look. It's also a punchy license, so you know, safe to use at work as well. All right, the next thing we have is um, npm block piece uh, reported malicious code module uh, get cookies. 
So uh, someone, I am not sure how it happened, hijacked the get cookies module and inserted remote code execution in there. And it was an um, NPM registry for a few hours. It was actually taken down really quick, essentially after someone reported that, hey, there's something fishy about that. It got taken down from NPM within like an hour, I think. And um, yeah, the way it worked is super simple. It basically added a code that looked for request headers that uh, was specifically formatted. So like G command H data I, and then it just executed the given command, uh, uh, command with the given data inside the whatever Node.js ran it, right? So once again, if you ran Node.js within Docker, that would, wouldn't be able to do anything. If you ran it within VM, the worst case, your VM is dead. Um, there were no reports of uh, application this in the wild actually. So I don't think anyone was be, was able to do that basically. Uh, yeah, as you can see here, there's a 5 a.m. There's initial report and 7 a.m. Everything was already taken down, which is huge props to NPM guys. This is kind of amazing. Um, it's also worth noting that the affected packages were uh, outdated. So uh, there's like, basically, if you don't have any legacy code, you should have not been affected by any of that. But it's still interesting, you know, that people were able to do that. And I like, I don't know the whole um, backstory here it would be interesting to see a more in depth read through on how exactly that happened. But uh, yeah. All right, continuing, we got uh, dockerizing or containerizing Node.js applications with Docker. So um, I've already talked about Docker and you know that uh, if you watch my stuff, you know that uh, Docker is my favorite deployment tool, essentially. I love containers. I love how easy it is to set all this stuff up and then deploy it to a variety of environments. But if you don't know what the Docker is, if you don't know what containers are, if you need, maybe you need a refresher as well, um, then this is a really good article that introduces you to the Docker, to the containers, how they work, what you need to know is the basics, and how to specifically Dockerize your Node.js apps. Um, on a very basic level, of course, so there's no like um, in-depth things, no, um, they do talk about like caching and um, access rights and all that stuff, but it is still a very, very basic intro. That still, if you never worked with them, uh, this is a really good one. So do have a look. Okay, continuing. We got uh, creating a real world command line application with Node.js. Um, this is essentially a tutorial that guides you through writing a command line app using the minimist package, which is the um, CLI arguments parsing. So you can always, of course, use process argv and parse it yourselves, which is actually annoying. So you don't really want to do that. Uh, Minimist is nice, but it's very bare bones. Uh, so um, in most cases, it will be fine. So again, the author of this article builds pretty straightforward command line tool uh, that just lists, um, what was it? I believe it was like weather. Yeah, it was weather, so forecast, right? So it's like just a couple of commands. But if you want to do something more complex, I would recommend looking at the yards or other um, command line argument processing packages that give you more advanced options. Still is a really good introduction and a uh, very good starting point for uh, making a nice command line app with, you know, argument parsing, loading uh, like indicators and everything. And uh, yeah, it's it's a really nice starter starting point for you basically. Okay, continuing. We got uh, switching from cluster module to PM2 and RabbitMQ in Node.js. So the article talks about um, how the author switched from using the cluster module, which is the part of the Node.js itself, to using PM2 and RabbitMQ to load balance the workers essentially, right? So um, if you didn't know, you can use cluster module to break down your app into several sub apps, so workers, uh, so you'd have a cluster master and then a couple of workers that typically are spawned according to the number of CPUs. And then you have, they do some work and then you know it gets distributed somehow across the other workers. Um, this whole scheme, I don't think that cluster is, is kind of fit for this. So cluster is generally used for splitting between the CPUs really. And this looks a bit weird in my opinion. And specifically for this case, I think using the RabbitMQ is way more uh, efficient than doing it with any internal tools. Um, okay, of course, it might not be just RabbitMQ, you could always take um, ZeroMQ or whatever, uh, any other message bus, Kafka, if you want, if you want to go crazy. 
And again, PM2 is basically just a process manager. So it just monitors the services, order restarts them and so on and so forth. So you can um, do that with something different like Docker, for example, that can cover some of those parts. Uh, at least in the swarm mode, for example, the balancing instances and all that stuff works perfectly fine out of the box with the default Docker configs. But in this case, the author goes on explaining how he used the PM2 uh, for that and then how he used RabbitMQ to actually load balance the workers and yeah, use the queues and you know. Uh, again, if you watch some of my stuff, I covered this partially. If not, then this is a pretty good introduction that describes all the pros and cons and how the author did it, which is, you know, pretty good. All right, continuing, we got, uh, well, this is not exactly JavaScript article, but I thought it's interesting anyway, um, because more and more languages get capabilities to compile to WebAssembly. This time around, there's an article talking about uh, compiling Ruby to WebAssembly, which is kind of on one hand crazy. On the other hand, if there is a way to compile something to LLVM, that likely means that you can compile it to WebAssembly as well, uh, at least in most cases, at least, right? So yeah, it's a pretty in-depth article um, explaining, you know, how do you get from Ruby to WebAssembly. So again, mscript is here, LLVM is here, Binarian is here. As you might imagine, your typical pipeline uh, and what they do is essentially take Ruby and compile it to C and then use your typical pipeline to bring it to WebAssembly. But it is a very in-depth uh, write out on how to do that yourself. So if you are using Ruby and want to try and compile something to the uh, WebAssembly and try to use it in the browser, this is your way to do that. Okay, continuing. Uh, we already talked about Node.js last time, but here we get uh, Node.js 10, the new, the changed and deprecated. This is sort of an overview article from Auth0 guys. And it's a very detailed, very well written uh, summary essentially of what has changed and uh, what was added, removed, deprecated in Node 10. So if for some reason you uh, somehow missed the last um, podcast or maybe you missed some news or maybe you didn't find the summary. This is a really, really good one that talks about just about everything, uh, including yeah, Node time travel with Chakra Core and an API support that we already talked about and deprecations and all that stuff. So do have a look at that. Okay, we got another article that is called uh, April 2018 release updates for the Node.js project. And there's like a bunch of updates here, but the most important things are the Node version four is going end of life uh, end of April, essentially, it's end of life now, right? So that was published a bit earlier when I collected it, but um, it's end of life. Uh, node six is now uh, in a maintenance mode, which means it will only get critical updates and security fixes. So no any like minor updates, bug fix, or like, I guess, feature additions and so on and so forth. No V8 upgrades, unless it's critical. Uh, V8 is continuing as active LTS. Node nine is basically dead now because we have node 10 and node 10 is yeah so we are basically getting more versions and at some point is going to go LTS I believe it was in October but uh, yeah so you know the future for node.js is bright and uh, if you're using s node 4 consider switching to 6 or maybe even 8 if you can uh, afford I mean it shouldn't be that hard actually there's not that many breaking changes there so definitely do switch to an LTS that's always a good idea. All right, continuing, we got a couple of news with regards to V8 6.7. It will actually ship with a big end support enabled by default, which is pretty damn fantastic. And I believe we're going to see a huge boost to the machine learning code and to anything that is basically number related, because prior to that, you couldn't actually work with numbers properly, right? Because, well, there was some a lot of iffy cases with Node.js, but uh, yeah, so as you can see here, uh, that's the demonstration of the one of the problems with the max safe integer node, right? So if you add two, it will break because well, you can, it cannot be bigger than that basically. But if you use big int, you can actually go beyond that, which is pretty amazing. And uh, speaking about that, there is another article co uh, called adding big ints to V8. This is from V8 team, and it essentially goes into a bit more depth into how the big int works. How exactly do you use it? I mean, the usage is super straightforward. You can literally just use the N uh, notation at the end to uh, denote that this is a big int, and then you can just 
use them. It works. It's it's great. You know, it's really straightforward. And then there's yeah a bit more uh, in depth look into how they are stored, how the begins are stored in memory, how they sign the digits and all that kind of stuff. And it's very interesting to read all of that stuff. So if you are interested in underlying uh, workings of uh, V8, do have a look at that. Okay, continuing, we got a um, very neat feature from VS Code. I thought I highlighted separately from the VA, uh, VS Code release uh, because it's just really cool. And uh, this is something I have already enabled in my editor. So you can now edit your settings and add uh, code actions on save, which can be just about anything, I believe. And one of the things you can do is basically you can uh, organize, auto-organize imports on save, which results in this, which is something that I have enabled and now I don't have to think about organizing imports anymore, which, which is bloody amazing. Once again, you know, less thinking about code formatting and organization, prettier now this, and it's just, it's it's a game changer basically for me at least. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is a CSS environment variables are getting standardized. So it's really cool to see that CSS is also moving towards you know the way that JavaScript moves. Basically, this is a feature that I believe was uh, in less first. Maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it was even before that. But essentially, this is something that is available in third party like languages that compile to CSS. And now you can actually use that or you will be able to use that once this is finalized and accepted within the CSS itself, which is, is, you know, it's always great that to see the language develop. It's like, yeah, um, it, it's, it's really cool. Really cool to see that. All right, continuing, uh, we got another small tip. So this is Something I didn't know actually didn't think about was possible. So I already talked about the fact that you can use npm install node at whatever version you want to run the current node project with whatever node version you install via npm. But what I didn't think about is that you can actually use npx to just run that node and you can pass the arguments like the local code to run it with that specific version, which is actually pretty great. And um, a very powerful tool. I mean, I wonder if if it's better. I guess it's not as efficient as using the um, what do you call them the CI like Travis here or whatever integrated version switchers, but still a pretty neat thing. Okay, continuing. We got. I think this is the last article. Yes, this is the last article before releases, and it's sort of a meta article. It's not exactly JavaScript, but it's a discussion why uh, this code is open source. Let's flip the question. So the article goes to discuss why would you not why would you keep your code closed source? And honestly, at this point in 2018, there is almost no reason to do that if you are a large company, unless you don't have people who would properly maintain it, which means you have some, you know, other problems essentially at this point. Um, but there's like a five reasons here why open source is good and why it makes sense to open source, maybe if not the whole infrastructure, you have at least some of it and why there's no harm to doing that, at least in 2018. It's like, uh, you know, if your code is so simple that if you open source it, your business can be copied, then well, maybe you have problems with your business. And if not, then why would you not open source it to allow people to help you basically build and maintain it, right? So it's, it's always a win-win. All right, now we're getting to the releases section. Um, once again, not that many releases this time around, but there are some pretty big ones. So the first one is the CK Editor, uh, CK Editor 5 version 10. Um, I'm not sure why that was a good idea to call it like this, but there you go. So um, it is a, the, what do you see is what do you get editor with a bunch of different things. Let me mute that so they're going to hear any music or whatever they have there. But it is a very rich editor. It has support integrated support for real time collaboration, almost Google Drive like or Google Docs like features with the commenting and everything seems to be pretty great. Uh, and now it's version 10. And it's yeah, GPL two and it looks quite amazing. I, to be honest, I never used it, but I probably will try because the list of the features they have is 
pretty impressive. So uh, if you are looking for an editor or if you've already been using it, have a look at that. Okay, next thing we have is Electron 2.0. There we go. This is like one huge release for um, JavaScript ecosystem essentially. So we got a whole lot of new things and changes and features. Uh, it's now Chrome 61, Node 8.9, which is the latest LTS, I believe. Uh, V8.6.1, unfortunately, not the 6.6, which is the latest stable, and uh, GTK plus 3 on Linux, which is kind of nice. Uh, In-app purchases support on macOS that we already talked about. Bunch of new APIs for different things, uh, new menu events that was, uh, I think, actively requested by the community. Some additional events, uh, and what is, no, that's not a warrant. Some additional events for um, stuff like a shutdown and yeah, basically macOS stuff. It seems to be pretty good. So I guess the highlights would be yeah, the bumps of the internal stuff and the in-app purchases and some new APIs, which is always welcome. And other things are just, you know, nice to have things. Uh, break, not that many breaking changes. I'm always surprised to see those guys uh, to have very little breaking changes, but I guess they have to do that because Electron depends or um, Atom depends on Electron and you don't really want to break a lot, right? Okay, next thing we got here is the Angular version 6. So if that's your gem, then well, you have a new version coming out right here. Seems to be mostly focused around the ecosystem. So the command line tools, there's been like a lot of very cool things here, including the fact that, you know, you can use the ng command line tool to generate uh, projects from starters, like the material, for example. And um, yes, workspaces support, library support, tree shakeable providers and all that kind of stuff. Oh yeah, and they've moved to the RxJS v6, which is also great, uh, which means the smaller bundle size. So yeah, if um, Angular is your gem, because I haven't touched it in ages, then this is this looks quite great actually. So, all right, continuing, we got uh, RxJS 6.1. It's a minor release, and the highlight is essentially the is observable method that finally allows you to properly check if the thing is observable. I've missed that for quite some time, but they finally added it and I'm definitely gonna use it. All right, and I think it's a last release. Yes, it, no, it is not a last, it's a one before, um, well, how do you put it in, it? whatever. So almost the last release. <laughs> it is a VS Code version 1.23. Um, ton of things, so first one is the Save actions, that's what I talked about. We now have highlighted ident guidelines, which is great, so you don't need any extensions for that anymore. There is now, um, you can use a middle mouse button to do the column selection, which is also great. So you're, I mean, sometimes I'm too lazy to do it with keyboard, but you can do it quite quickly with a mouse. Um, there is now NPM script support. So you can actually enable the script explorer and you will see the NPM scripts within the run block. So you can run them from your uh, editor and you can also do that from the command palette, which is great. Uh, there's some Git improvements as well, which is boring. There's obviously like, yeah, additional stuff for integrated terminal, additional languages folding and a bunch of, I don't know, is there any other interesting things? There's like improvements to extension development, which is also always great to see. I think everything else is more or less like under the hood stuff. Uh, so yeah, those, I guess the uh, code actions on save scripts and highlights, uh, highlighted and dense are the sort of highlights. All right, and the last release we got this week is the HTML5 game engine called Impact. Uh, it's been actually on the market for a hell of a lot of time, six years it seems. I don't know if that's even more than that probably, but it's actually a really good looking one, really, um, it seems like has a really good tooling around it. But before it was actually a paid engine that you had to like pay to access for, you know, we had like any level editors and it works on mobiles and everything. And it looked really cool, but I never tried it because you know, you have to pay for that. You have to um, purchase the license. And then if you are just a guy who builds whatever in his weekends, you don't really want to do that. You just want to try something, try something and see if that's, you know, kind of fun or not. 
Well, now you can. So uh, it is now completely open source. You can grab it on GitHub. It has all the tools, all the libraries, all the media, whatever you can imagine. All of the code is open source. And um, yeah, along with the docs that are present on the website, you can probably build quite a lot of really cool games with it. So yeah, um, this is it for the releases. Now we're coming to the uh, cool libraries, demos and website section essentially. And the first project we have today is MDX. Um, I think it started as um, kind of the older project. I don't know if they merged it in the end or not, but uh, it basically regained the traction once uh, Guillermo Rausch, the guy from Zeit, uh tweeted about, hey, I want the Markdown, but with a React support. So JSX in Markdown, right? And this is exactly what they did. You literally have a Markdown where you can import and execute React components, which is kind of crazy, but I really like it. <laughs> And uh, when you think about the possibilities, so you can write, you can easily write a very simple um, markdown files, which is documentation, and it can include stuff like, you know, charts from the React, which is kind of great. So I really like that approach. We'll see where it leads, basically. Yeah, there you go. There's two side guys involved. Okay, uh, next project we have is OW or OW. I'm not sure how to, probably OW, I guess. I uh, looking by the the logo it's ow yes it's from Sinrosaurus as usual this guy pumps out tons of libraries so this is um argument validation for humans right so it's a very simple way to validate your arguments and this is the basic one right so this means that input should be a string and at least five characters long the nice thing is that uh, of course you can do like if and then throw which is not nice but this actually provides you detailed errors which is always great and considering in the library is super tiny as usually happens from Sindrosaurus it is very nice um, alternative to writing your own validation essentially and has a lot of like primitives types arrays whatever you can imagine all is here okay next thing we have is google it is um packaged to essentially validate if the request is coming from google crawlers uh, is it like or yeah, using the Google DNS verification steps. So there's, if you didn't know, there's a bunch of ways to figure out if the crawler is from uh, Google, because it's quite easy to fake the, um, what do you call it? The, oh man, what do you call the thing? The line, the Google user agent string, right? So it's really easy to fake the user agent string, but it is impossible to fake up the DNS lookup, right? Or I guess not impossible, but. It's way harder than changing the user agent. Let's put it this way. So this package basically gives you a very simple way to validate if the uh, thing is Googlebot or not. And if it's not, then, you know, you can do something with it. So uh, very straightforward, very simple, works relatively well, it seems. So if you ever need that, do have a look at this. All right, continuing, we got Nanopipe. Uh, it is basically a library, a tiny library, less than 450 bytes to create uh, chainable functions or pipelines uh, with support for sync generators, which is nice. So it is sort of like the pipe function for ES, whatever it will be, 2019, I guess. But you can use it right now and it's uh, the syntax is like this, right? So you, you define your function, then you say nano pipe pipeable and you wrap your function in it. Uh, it seems like it modifies the prototype, which is, I don't know if I like it, but you know, it seems to be working. So you can actually pipe stuff afterwards, uh, one into another and then, um, yeah. So if you are looking for something like this, it seems to be far away from production ready prior release history, but uh, definitely a something to keep an eye on unless we get the new Babel soon with, with the pipe operator, then you don't need it. Okay, continuing, we got the Jest Chain. It's a small plugin for Jest, I guess. I'm not sure how you call them. Uh, is it a plugin or what do you, is it setup test, fra okay, test framework script file, yeah. So it's a, extension for Jest, let's put it this way, that allows you to chain assertions. I'm actually super surprised you cannot do this natively in Jest, which kind of makes a lot of sense when you think about it. 
But obviously you need, um, um, not obviously, apparently you need a separate library for that. So it basically allows you to chain assertions to the same uh, variable, right? So if you are looking to do that, mm, that seems to be quite nice. I'm actually can think of a couple of cases when it might be a problem, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I'm basically interested in how that will work. So basically, yeah, if you are looking to chain things and just have a look at that. Right, continuing, we got load assets. It's a basically loader for single module assets uh, that is uses promises. Um, it is experimental, so it's not production ready. And the cool thing is that it supports stuff down to EA11, which is kind of great. And yeah, it can basically load anything you can imagine. And yeah, syntax is super simple, right? So looks pretty good. So if you're looking for asset loader, then this might be your uh, might be a good option. Um, it's MIT licensed is always pretty great. It is version 113 already. I'm not sure why is it still experimental, but hey, not for me to judge. All right, let's go next. So we got a sync stream generator. It's um, yeah, you can take ES6 sync generators and pipe them through Node.js streams, which is quite nice. So you can um, basically work with a stream as if it was a generator, right? Uh, which is always pretty cool. And I'm like, I don't immediately see use cases for that, but maybe you do. So do have a look at that's your beat. Right, another string from Sindris Horus. As usual, this guy has billions of packages published on uh, GitHub. And if you use them to support him on Patreon, that's always good. So this is a thing to convert basically string buffer or uint array to a readable stream, which is quite nice from time to time. Uh, the advantage obviously is that it's super tiny. I typically, when I need to convert stuff for stream, I use Highland JS, which is not just um, conversion to streams, but also like a stream library, which is similar to Wadash for streams. Basically, it has a ton of metas that are really, really useful. Uh, but yeah. Okay, next thing we have is a Proton native. So this is essentially React native for desktops, um, which seems to be working pretty well. So you have like abstractions like app window button and so on and so forth. And it actually renders the real uh, app. So like using the native UI. So you, you actually see the proper, you know, Windows stuff here. So it's not, not Electron, not browser, it's actual UI, which is great pretty great. And uh, from what I read, from what I figured out in the comments, and you know, like reading about it, and so on and so forth, it actually works on top of the libui node, which I have not heard before about. It is a bindings for libui, which is a awesome native UI library that works on Unix, OS X and Windows. Essentially, it's a multi platform and allows you to do just about any UIs, which is pretty cool. And uh, Proton Native gives you a React Native like interface to it, basically. So it's uh, pretty nice to see stuff like that. Next thing we have is a VS Code theme, actually quite new one, uh, which looks quite nice, but a bit too relaxed, in my opinion. It's called Relax theme, <laughs> which is, you know, kind of reflects what it does. It's a very nice looking theme, but um, I found it to be a bit too relaxed. So I do like my uh, material theme quite much more, but maybe you like this one more. So do have a look. All right, uh, then we got a couple of demos, I guess, or projects. Uh, this one is really cool. So it's not actually Node.js. It is a deep learning or machine learning project that allows you to build machine learning pipelines using visual interface. So you can actually, you know, capture stuff from the camera, then detect features, generate labels, and then show the results. Um, and all of it sort of presented in a very visual format, which is really, really cool. Uh, have not tried it yet myself, but the editor uh, looks very nifty and very nice. Uh, this is why I thought it would be pretty cool to show that on a podcast because this is JavaScript, right? So that's a very nicely looking thing. I wonder if they will open source this at some point because I would love to play around with it. And yeah, TensorFlow, Keras, CoreML, whatever you can imagine, all that stuff works. All right, uh, continuing, we got two things related to GDPR. Um, so if, you, if you're working in any company that have to deal with the user data, you know GDPR is a huge pain in the ass and 
uh, it's a large document that is really hard to get through and you know because it's it's written in a very um i just wouldn't call it science it's a very bureaucratic language let's put it this way and it can be hard to figure out what the hell you're supposed to do so i have two things to help you with that one is this gdpr checklist which is essentially a very simple checklist that um sort of briefly covers all you have to do it is basic guidelines so this is not 100 percent saves you from all the gdpr problems but you have to at least follow this now once you've done with this there is another really cool thing so the guys at algolia made the gdpr uh document searchable as i said it's a huge document there is like 11 chapters here and i think like hell if i know how many pages are there but a lot but basically with this, you can uh, actually search it. And uh, wait, wait, I, I misspelled privacy somehow. There's no results for privacy data. There you go, there's a lot of results for data. And yeah, it's a very nice tool for basically figuring out uh, specifics. All right, that's it for the serious stuff. Let's look at the silly stuff before we wrap this thing up. Um, <laughs> this is now my favorite way to memorize how to make or compress the tar file so instead of googling it you just have to remember that uh, extract z files uh, which is you have to say it with german accent which makes perfect sense to me i don't know about you guys but um, this is probably the best way to remember extract z files that i've ever heard there's also um i think what was that there was another th joke here i think the compress z files also works in exactly the same yeah there you go there it is compress z files it's also the same way which is pro i will never forget this again this is like this is just perfect all right um next thing we have here is more of a kind of funny interesting tool to give you some insights into your github life uh, it's a github contribution generator so you can actually um let me just permit the javascript here actually enter your name and see all your contributions over the past years when you was registered in github as you can see i am very random and it is just sometimes i don't write anything and then all of a sudden i just write like three weeks of hard work and that's like yeah i think that's how i work mostly <laughs> so yeah it's a uh, pretty interesting to anyway get an insight on how you worked in the past years and uh yeah uh, try it out for yourself you can save this image share it on twitter i shared mine that's pretty cool um you can also switch themes and uh yeah okay you don't even have to click anymore nice uh yeah so if you, if you like more dark themes they have them okay last thing we have here is this insane illustration done in pure html and css which is you know when you look at it it's crazy but wait that's not the coolest part the coolest part is that this stuff works in older browsers wait wait for it there you go so this is how it looks in chrome 17 firefox 36 and chrome 9 and Ender explorer 517 so this is very old one right so this is chrome 17 i think still has like support for most of the css features it looks okay ish then if we go to firefox 36 <laughs> i just cannot look seriously at that then if we go even before that, so I think this is Chrome 9. And then if we go to Internet Explorer 5, it looks like this. <laughs> this is just in like, look at that stuff. The cool thing is that it actually still works and it still kind of looks like a painting, but um, yeah, anyway, it's, it's kind of fascinating to see how far the CSS came basically at this point. All right, um, I think that's actually it from my side, guys. So unless you have any things you wanna discuss, maybe I missed something during this week, maybe you have some questions on the things that I've talked, or maybe you want to just ask something, that's also fine. Come on, get up. There we go. Um, yeah, just ask away in the chat. I will wait for a couple of minutes in case someone sends a question. And if there's no questions, we can basically wrap this up here. And as I said before, you can find the um, all the links that I mentioned today on a GitHub uh, under the episode nine. Um, once again, if you have links that you think are interesting and you want me to cover, uh, feel free to send them my way through Twitter, Discord server, uh, twitch or github or whatever the way that you want i'm always happy to see 
cool projects if you know maybe it's your project maybe you want to cover uh, your own project i would be happy to do that um i found this yesterday let's have a look what do we have here a uh, lot t web render after effects animations natively on web what the <laughs> that sounds crazy okay so it's a library from Airbnb that allows to render After Effects animations natively on web, Android, iOS, and React Native. That is, wow, okay. That is insane. And it's written in JavaScript. That is even more insane. Okay. Okay. This is probably the most impressive thing I've seen this week. <laughs> All right, okay, now I know how Airbnb guys do those crazy animations. That explains a lot. This is really cool, thanks for sharing. So I <clears throat> I think I should add that to the, to, the, uh, to the today's episode because this is just awesome, okay. And if that, we got ta -da 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 -da, uh, libs and demos. Let's add it somewhere here maybe. And uh, we got Slotty. There we go. That is, yeah, Strax, this is really awesome. Thank you for sharing. That was like, that's kind of mind blowing, to be honest. Okay, do you guys have any other crazy things that you found and you want to share? I would be very happy to see them. And uh, yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> it's just like, how do you even do the, wait a second, I'm curious. So I'm going to wait for a few more minutes. Meanwhile, I want to have a look at the source code because I am now super curious at how the hell does this stuff works. Uh, documentation. Yes, please tell me how do I do that? Uh, yeah, the fact that it works with like written with JS is kind of crazy. So let's see web. Um, blah, 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 blah. animation load my animations. So how do you generate the animations? Getting start. No, wait, that's uh, getting started for web static player. Uh, you can get scripts, npm install, HTML. So you include the JavaScripts, then you load the animation. Okay, the animation. Wait, does, does the um, After Effects can just export the animations in JSON? Is that how it works? Because if it can, then this is not as impressive anymore. <laughs> I mean, it still looks really cool, but you know, if you already have all animation described in the After Effects animation export, basic of rendering. Um, so, okay, blah, blah, blah. Render is a queue, queue panel, render rhythm status, pause. Is there a JSON? No, it doesn't seem so. Can export into SVG. Okay, so that is an S, but um, hmm. interesting. Making SVG anime. Okay, ah, okay, that make. Okay, that makes it twenty-five times easier. I thought they had some crazy stuff going in the background. Uh, still really impressive, but you know the fact that it is SVG makes it less crazy than I thought it would be. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, um, I guess no more things to discuss, no more links to share, no more questions. So let's stop it here. Thank you guys for watching. This was BXJS Weekly episode nine. I hope you enjoyed all the links. If you have new cool things to share, do send them my way. We'll be always happy to see them. Um, yeah, I guess have a nice weekend and I basically see you next week. Wait a second, I have to try this new... Um, remote control for 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 streamlabs because they've added this thing okay there we go so thank you for watching and i see you next week bye